Ederne in modern Turkey. It's the site of the old Roman town of Adrianople. I'm Matthew Settle. In August 378 AD, a Roman army of 20,000, commanded by the Emperor Valens, faced a barbarian horde of over 100,000 under their leader, Fritiger. They had to be stopped, or barbarian tribes from the German forest to the steppes of Asia would flood in and destroy the old empire. The Romans decided to halt the tribes here at Adrianople. Now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wish they had. Now, on Decisive Battles. By the end of the fourth century, the once mighty Roman Empire was in serious trouble. Economic collapse, barbarian raids, and civil war had brought it to its knees. All Rome's frontiers were under pressure. The barbarians were at the gates. Roman civilization was under threat. There was not the centrality that we had seen in the seven uh, prior centuries. So it was more a conglomeration of peoples than it was a uniform language, a uniform culture, a uniform government that we'd seen in the past. To make it easier to rule and defend, the Roman Empire had been split into eastern and western halves. In 378, the east was ruled by the Emperor Flavius Valens, and the west by his young nephew, Flavius Gratian. According to the writings of Ammianus, a Roman officer at the time, Valens was 50 years old, an experienced commander. But he was lazy and getting fat, going blind in one eye. Gratian was also a skillful general, but only in his 20s. Valens was jealous of his younger nephew's success in the West. Gratian, the nephew of Valens, who was young in his teens, then you had Valens himself, an older, more mature, but there was nobody on the scene who had fought in a series of campaigns over years and had the maturity of age and the vigor of youth. The Roman legions were now employed in a mainly defensive role, guarding the empire's borders. The Goths were a nomadic people who had wandered from their overcrowded homeland, most probably Scandinavia, and had traveled steadily southward. For over a hundred years in the east, the Goths and the Romans had faced one another across the Danube River. They did not seek to have a chunk of the empire. They sought admission to the empire. And the reason they sought admission to the empire was that their world had been destroyed by the arrival of new peoples, primarily the Huns. As the Goths' numbers grew into hundreds of thousands, they sought a new homeland, a place to settle, and they began to invade Roman territories. In the end, the Romans granted the Goths refugee status and allowed them to cross the Danube. There were no census data to project how many hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people might be coming in, the commander on the scene would have been able to say to a boatload, sure guys, come on in, you can bring your wives and family. The Danube is a huge river, up to half a mile wide, but the Goths were desperate. So in 376, they climbed aboard small rafts, boats, even hauled out logs and began to cross the swollen river. Some of them even tried to swim. Hundreds drowned. But the horde finally crossed it, and the Romans were alarmed with its size. They crossed the river. They were encamped, generally outside of these towns, and the food supplies ran out. According to our source, Almianus Marcellinus, the Goths were so starved that rather than watching their children perish, they traded their children as slaves sold them into slavery and in return received dogs to eat. Thousands upon thousands of homeless, hungry, and heavily armed refugees camped inside the borders of the empire. 
A local Roman leader, Lupusinus, panicked and ordered the assassination of the Gothic leaders. Lupusinus invited the leaders to a banquet, and the banquet was going to be their last banquet. He set the stage for a massacre. Some of the Gothic uh, commanders got out alive. One of them was Fritigern. Several were killed. But Fritigern, a tribal chief, escaped, led the Goths in an open revolt. They immediately attacked the nearest Roman garrison, Marcianople. Lupusinus and his legions blocked their way to the city. But instead of attacking along a wide front, the Goths formed into long columns. Driven on by hunger and anger, they smashed through the Roman line. Lupusinus escaped. But 5,000 legionaries, most of his army, lay dead. Gratian had an army in Rome, but that was nearly a thousand miles away. For now, Valens and his legions were all that stood between the barbarians and the end of the empire. In 378 AD, the Roman Empire is under threat from the Goths, a massive barbarian horde which has crossed the Danube and swamped Roman territory. 25,000 Roman infantry would meet the invaders here, in Turkey, at Adrianople. The Goths' numbers were growing all the time as other refugee tribes joined them. Tribes such as the Alans, with large numbers of cavalry, and the Huns. Like a plague of locusts, the refugees were stripping the land. 
we have the classic situation in which Valens receives a message from Gratian which says, please wait in dealing with the problem because I'm coming to help. While the argument raged, Fritigern sent a Christian priest with an offer of peace in exchange for land for the Goths. It may have been a genuine offer, or he may have been stalling for time, waiting for reinforcements. But Valens decided to fight. Worst possible solution was simply to confront the Goths himself uh, with a single army uh, in a way that favored the, the enemy tactically, and that's what he did. It was because he was jealous and wanted the glory for himself. August 9th, 378 was a blisteringly hot day. Valens left his baggage train and the imperial treasure inside the walls of Adrianople and marched at the head of his army to meet the Goths. The Goths were a people on the move. Families, women, children, slaves, and captives. When traveling, their baggage train alone stretched six miles. Now, as they prepared for battle, the Goths made good use of these wagons. They drew them up in a circle, like the early Western settlers in the United States who drew their wagons into a circle to defend against attacking Indians. A nomadic people uh, travels civilian and soldier alike, and then in the evening, they circle the wagons and they yoke the tongue of the wagon uh, with one another, and therefore they can create a de facto fortified position very quickly and instantaneously in a way that even the Roman army could not. It gave impetus to the soldier to fight with the idea that if he lost, he wouldn't just lose the battle, but he would lose his livelihood, maybe his family. So it was a very effective concept. The Goths only used the wagon circle as a fallback position. They preferred to fight in the open, on the plain, with plenty of room to maneuver. The Roman army which faced the Goths still resembled the army of Julius Caesar, and the Rome of 400 years earlier. The troops at the Battle of Adrianople were basically your standard infantry of the late Roman Empire. They would have been armed with weapons that Julius Caesar would have recognized, but they would have been different. The shield was a different shape. The sword was a bit longer. The armor was essentially the same as in the days of Julius Caesar. Fritigern moved his troops into formation, well out in front of the wagon circle. But he had no intention of fighting. He was playing for time and preparing a trap for his Roman enemies. <laughs> 378 AD. In what is now Turkey, the legions of Rome's Eastern Empire are fighting to save their land from invasion by the Goths. Two armies faced each other outside the walls of Adrianople. But the Goth leader Fritigern was determined to keep Rome waiting. He was playing for time as large numbers of his cavalry were scattered, foraging for grass and food. This was August in the Balkans. There's nothing to eat for horses. They were in the nearby ravines, uh, pasturing their horses. This was why the Roman scouts had seen few cavalry and underestimated the Goth numbers at only 10,000. When the outlying cavalry returned to the army, its numbers would swell by thousands more. Fritigern stalled by once again sending an envoy to Valens, pretending that he wanted to open peace negotiations. While the coming and going continued, the Roman soldiers stood around in the burning heat. Why Valens bothered with negotiations is anybody's guess. Perhaps he realized the Goth army was bigger than he thought. But then without warning, the battle began. An elite Roman cavalry unit and a band of archers had been skirmishing with the Goth right wing. The Roman skirmishers were troops who moved out in front of the main force, probing the enemy line for weaknesses. But they chose to attack just as Fritigern's cavalry reinforcements arrived. The skirmish became a full-blown battle. Gothic cavalry was nomadic, and that would mean that although the horses themselves would not be as 
large or as well protected as Central European horses and cavalrymen. They would be more mobile. Fritigard's new cavalry cut through the skirmishers and sent them into headlong retreat. The battle had started so suddenly that the Romans were still getting into formation. Valens had marched for a number of hours that day. It was hot, his men had no water. If he had have stopped, assembled his army in a uniform manner, then he probably would have had a lot better luck. An eight mile march means, of course, that his army arrives relatively tired. They're hungry. It's a very hot day. By the time they get there, it's gone midday. Sensing weakness, Fritigern launched a cavalry attack along the entire Roman line. There was chaos in the ranks. The whole Roman army seemed to be in retreat but then slowly began to rally as soldiers shouted encouragement to one another. The fighting spread like wildfire, with thousands of arrows and javelins raining down on the Roman ranks. The Goths held their formation, but the Roman army began to disintegrate into separate fighting units. They had the big disadvantage that they were surrounded and they were hot. Retreating Roman horsemen raced back through their own ranks, causing panic among the remaining cavalry, most of which galloped away. Fritigern's infantry was drawn up in great columns. Now they charged headlong and smashed into the Roman ranks like human battering rams. Hand-to-hand -hand slaughter began. The key to remember, they were an individual tribal uh, force that put more emphasis on individual kills, individual prowess in battle, rather than marching in time, advancing on order. A handful of Roman cavalry who remained on the left wing were forced back by the Goths and fled in confusion. Roman left flank now fully exposed, the Goth cavalry moved in. Without cavalry support, the Roman army was being pressed together on all sides. The battle was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was hot. It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Soldiers started at dawn, force marched, hadn't eaten, no noon meal and they were surrounded and cut down. A first-hand account about the last moments of the battle were recorded by the Roman officer and historian, Ammianus. Dust arose in such clouds as to hide the sky, which rang with fearful shouts. In consequence, it was impossible to see the enemy's missiles in flight and dodge them. All found their mark and dealt death on every side. The barbarians poured on in huge columns, trampling down horse and man and crushing our ranks, so to make orderly retreat impossible. Ammianus has a very vivid description of heads flying, limbs cut off, and the chaos, the dust, the panic, the shouting, the screaming of what happens when you have several thousand men who know they're going to die and there's no way out. The slaughter was terrible. By the end of the battle, two-thirds of the Roman army, at least 10,000 men, had died. Among them was Valens. The emperor died either on the battlefield or he got away a brief moment to a farmhouse nearby that was set fire and he was cremated. And anyway, 
he didn't see the sunset on the 9th of August. An emperor was dead, and the Goths were victorious. When Gratian heard of the defeat, he turned and headed back to his own Western Empire. But he could not turn his back on the Gothic threat. The victory at Adrianople showed other tribes that the Romans could be defeated and that there was land to be grabbed within the empire. After Adrianople, the Roman legions never regained their old dominance over the barbarian invaders. Adrianople was significant for a variety of reasons. One, a Roman emperor himself was at the battle and was killed in the battle, and his body wasn't even found. And it gave the impression that East would not work with the West, as happened at this battle, and that a tribal nomadic people in a battle of shock, hand-to-hand -hand warfare, showed greater battle, battle proudness and individual courage. So it sent a ripple effect through the emperor that either Romans could not or would not fight to protect their borders. For the next 30 years, the conflict raged on in Turkey, neither side capable of defeating the other outright. But the invading tribes steadily grew in number, until in 409, the Goths finally broke through. They poured west into Italy, and in 410, captured and burned the city of Rome. 700 years of Roman civilization finally came to an end.